Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me an artist who I've interviewed before, but in the midst of COVID and therefore from her house, this is Missy Dunaway. Thanks for being here in person today. Thank you for having me, Lisa. The last time I believe we spoke about things like uh, chickens and was it a cat that we also had a conversation around at your house? Yeah, Thomas. Thomas um, the cat. Yeah. But you've moved on to animals of a different sort. That's right. Yes. In fact, we have an example of this right behind us, and these are of the avian sort. I guess not technically. Are they technically animals or just technic? Okay. Yeah. We put them broadly under the animal category. Right. Or creatures, we could creatures. say. Creatures. Okay. <laughs> Very good. And these are related to Shakespeare. Right. Tell me about this piece. So I am currently on the road to painting every bird mentioned by Shakespeare. Uh, it is about 64 species, but that number is subject to change. Um, and I've currently completed about a quarter of the whole collection, so it will take me uh, several more years. Um, but the idea is that each painting offers um, information for the viewer, as much information as possible um, about natural science facts about the bird, and then also literary interpretation of how Shakespeare uses it as a symbol in his world. Um, so yeah, the, behind us we have the peregrine falcon, um, which uh, even though Shakespeare, I think it's pretty safe to say that he was a, a falconer um, and had a lot of experience with falconry, specifically the peregrine falcon is only mentioned uh, one time in Romeo and Juliet. In order to decide, uh, well, in order to go through and kind of create a map for yourself, did you read all of the works of Shakespeare? So I'm currently in the process of reading all of the works. I'm almost there. Uh, but luckily, um, my uh, project is heavily based on researchers before me. So James Edmund Harding uh, wrote a book called The uh, Birds of Shakespeare in 1871. He was a pretty well-known um, English ornithologist and naturalist. And uh, so he already did all the hard work for me in locating the birds. And his book is one of the most valuable ones in my research. Um, that's where I started with this project, uh, partially because that's where I got the list. So how does one get interested in this in particular? It seems like a very specific thing that you're doing, which is kind of similar. You've done a lot of very specific things. You, you have kind of a diversity of interests, but you, you go broad and go deep. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Um, I, uh, I, I suppose that the project started, um, or the root of it was in uh, college. Um, I had taken a Shakespeare course just to fill an elective, um, and I wasn't even all that interested in Shakespeare. I just thought, you know, since I'm going to college, when I graduate, I want to be a well-rounded person, and therefore I must know something about Shakespeare. And um, I, I really was surprised. I was constantly surprised by how much I connected with his work, how it was so entertaining and insightful. And um, I, uh, after my class, I would often get lunch with a computer science major and we would argue about Shakespeare. And he um, just one day he, he was like, it's just so overrated. I don't get it. I've never seen a Shakespeare play that I connect with. And instead of trying to convince him about the value of the themes or the artistry, um, I instead grasped at numbers that could quantify Shakespeare's talent. Um, so as an average American college graduate, my uh, vocabulary is around 16,000 words. And Shakespeare, just in his 39 plays, I think 39, he demonstrates a vocabulary of over 30,000 words. Um, and he was also a word chemist. Like he made new words, he used slang, he created new, like just... Um, uh, I mean, as a what he contributed to language in general, anyone could appreciate and admire. Um, and so I said to my friend, I was was talking about his vocabulary, and I said, like, just look at birds. He mentioned sixty four different types of birds, and that's just birds. Um, and when I said that, I thought, oh, that'd be a good painting. So I kept it in mind. And then um, the first time, that I tried to paint on this topic was as an artist in residence at um, Vermont Studio Center, where I had this huge studio space. So I was able to um, like lay out an eight piece, eight foot piece of paper, and I did feathers from every bird mentioned in Shakespeare. And uh, I was really proud of that piece, and I'm still proud of it. And it found the perfect home at the Folger Shakespeare Library. Um, but over the years, I mean, I did that piece when I was like 22. So ever since then, you know, I learned a little bit more about birds. 
And along the way, I've just found inaccuracies in my um, in my uh, paintings of the feathers because uh, I didn't know that much. So, for example, a kestrel. Um, if you see just a picture of a kestrel in the sky, uh, you know, in a Google image search, which is what I was using pretty much, um, kestrels look like they're huge, like hawks, but they're actually the size of a pigeon. So in my painting, the kestrel feather is huge and other big birds have small feathers, things like that. So I always thought I really want to redo that painting with greater scientific accuracy about, you know, just the feathers and the rendering. Um, And COVID presented the opportunity. My whole schedule was cleared and I thought, Now's the time I'm going to redo the Shakespeare painting. Um, So I redid it, and it was sold through the gallery. Thank you, Portland Art Gallery. And um, when it was done, I felt kind of not disappointed, but maybe just a little bit like, is that all there is? Like, I, it's such a good idea. I feel like there's more here. I don't want it to be over. So then I thought, okay, if I want to expand it, the obvious answer is to do one painting for each bird. That's, That's the long story behind it. How many birds in are you at this point? 17, but I think I'm going to redo the magpie. So I hate to knock myself back to 16, but I, you know. How long does each of these pieces take you? So that's um, kind of a um, more complex question because the, the actual rendering of it, I'd say, would take um, between 50 and 70 hours. It's about t- two weeks to actually paint it. Um, however, the research behind it uh, and revisions after it's done always take up time. Um, I'm not an ornithologist or an avian ecologist or a Shakespeare scholar by any stretch of the imagination. So um, instead, I've, uh, you know, to, to make up for those shortcomings, I've assembled a bit of a team of three different advisors to fact check um, the anatomy of the birds with an ornithologist. Uh, and a uh, botanist to check the plants. This painting doesn't have any plants, but most of them do. Um, and then also a Shakespeare scholar who's double-checking, um, you know, to make sure I'm interpreting the text correctly. So all three of those advisors always have edits and revisions for me to make, so that adds on time. So I'd say, uh, yeah, each piece takes maybe a solid month of like research and writing and discussions and then the painting. So if you were a scientist, this would be the equivalent of uh, publishing an article every time, the amount of work that you're actually putting into each of these pieces. These are your visual article, it almost seems like. Yes, that's exactly how I would describe my the carpet series that I did as a Fulbrighter in Turkey. I was a researcher, but my findings were communicated in a series of paintings instead of written articles. So yes, exactly. Which is actually more of a thing now that qualitative research is including more visual pieces. So just sitting here talking with you, I'm, it's it's very interesting that um, the different fields are coming at it from different directions, but encouraging the same sort of approach. Yes, yeah, I I agree, and I like that because I think it makes um, the the information more accessible because you're um, you know you're reaching more people. Uh, You know, I don't think that you would have to. Under, you know, even know the English language to look at my painting and learn a little something about how Shakespeare uh, writes about birds um, or learn something about the bird in general. So that's definitely the idea, I think, of, of using um, a visual form to communicate information is that it makes it more accessible to everybody. Yeah, that's a great point. And more uh, people, I should say. Yes. And some people will probably resonate with it. Other people, it may not be as... as um, may not resonate as much with them. But I think about the number of children, for example, who go to museums or who engage with art. And because they don't necessarily have uh, word expertise yet, but they do already have eyes, that sort of um, kind of creativity that's being um, built in their little brains, I just, I find that really appealing. Yeah, the first time I read Shakespeare, I mean, he's not meant to be read. You're supposed to be watching it on stage. And I just leading up to the moment in high school when I was first introduced to Shakespeare, I thought it was literature because he's taught as literature. The plays are taught as literature. And I remember my high school teacher just having like really pumping us up about Shakespeare. Like, you want romance? He's got it. You want action? He's got it. I was like, yeah, like, I'm so excited. He's like, okay, let's flip open the books now. Let's start on stanza 
line whatever and I'm looking at it I was like what am I looking at it's just this is just dialogue I was so confused and it immediately turned me off and um yeah I I wish maybe that the first introduction would have been to actually go see a play because I think the visual form would have been um uh, more relatable to me and accessible to me at that age and uh not only that but um I, I, but I'm not sure because sometimes when I was in high school, I did see a Shakespeare play and the language still felt inaccessible and I had no idea what was going on. Um, but in a painting, uh, hopefully the language is put into a very um, immediate form. You've done a lot of work with realism. And in particular, you've worked with one of our other artists, um, Rodney Dennis. And um, I'm, I'm, it takes so much work to do the the realistic paintings and the realistic pieces that both of you do, like hours and hours and hours. Um, tell me about that process. You know, I love the hours and hours and hours. I At first, I thought there's no way I can do this, but I really wanted to get better at drawing. Uh, it's always been my um, weakness as an artist. Uh, I have a pretty good sensibility for color, but my drawing is just pretty weak. So um, the uh, Academy of Real Estate, where me and Rod um, met as students, uh, yeah, that's what they focus on. And so, um, but you have to be prepared to put in several hundred hours into a single drawing. One drawing will command an entire semester. And you just have to go to a different place when you're doing it. It's very meditative. Um, but actually, I was like crushing podcasts on Shakespeare. So it has also been handy, like research time, because um, you're just like devouring, um, you know, audio uh, news and podcasts. But anyway, um, I really feel like the uh, just. Um, the way that technology is going and social media, I mean, we talk about it so often, like how information is just getting cut up into smaller and smaller sound bites. Um, I just found myself craving like long form, deep dives. And I, I have found that at um, the Academy of Real Estate. And it was nice because sometimes I was worried, like, is my attention span permanently damaged by social media? And I can only listen to a song if it's under three minutes and things. And um Nope, that's definitely not the case. You can get your attention span back. It takes a little bit of practice, but, um, you know, me and Rod were not even, I mean, uh, I'd say, you know, other students, there's so many students that have come to that school that had no background in art and might not have at first had the attention span to do it or the patience, I should say, but it's a skill that you can exercise. And once you're used to it, it's really rewarding and relaxing and so refreshing at, at you know, right now. I'm, I'm thinking when I look at this piece that you brought today, which I know we're going to show um, online for people who are watching the video version of this podcast, that to put an entire, I guess, it's a semester perhaps, is that how much time it takes into one piece and have that be your one final thing, that is unusual for someone who's working in art, Correct. I guess maybe unusual ever since, um, I don't know, like maybe impressionism. Like I I think up until, um, so impressionists were really the first to break out of the studio and go outdoors because one of the technological advances of the Industrial Revolution was tubed paint. So up until that point, you're just grinding down your own paint in your studio and the, um, you know, there's a lot of gear. It's just, it's not a a transportable hobby or, or a career. So, um, when tubed paint was created, people could go outdoors and then they're studying natural light. And then you have to paint fast because you're keeping up with light changing. Um, and then of course with ex- expressionism and, um, I mean, then artwork just broke free, like, especially with photography that came around, why labor over doing something that's super realistic when you can take a photo, like artists were liberated to explore all these different things to express and, and to, um, capture. So, uh, yeah, it, um, oh, I've lost my train of thought. I think you were talking about, um, working on one piece for a semester, which it sounds like if I can guess where you're going, that this maybe used to be a thing. And then 
with this, um, these new technologies, it became that you were able to do more things in less time. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, culturally today, uh, putting that much time into a single piece is unusual, but I think in the grand scheme of art, um, it's, uh, there was a time when it was the normal thing to do. Um, and there's that, there's a pretty big comeback of realist painters, um, like contemporary realist painters right now that I'm just loving. Um, so I think time investment, um, you know, it's, it's different from artist to artist. Sometimes I'm really surprised at, especially at Portland Art Gallery, there's such an array of styles. And occasionally I'll be speaking to an artist that has a pretty minimal approach. And I assume that, wow, they, like, they probably get this done in one day. And then I find out, it no, it takes like a month and a half. Like it's, it does take, sometimes the, um, the, the image itself could be very deceiving to the amount of work and time that goes into it. Well, that's similar to say, medicine, where somebody can say, hey, can you look at this mole? Oh, that's only going to take you two seconds. But it, it took you the two seconds to look at the mole, but it took you all of the years of education <laughs> that brought you to the place where you can look at the mole and say, oh, yeah, that's don't worry about that, or you should have that looked at further. So I do think you're right, that you can never really know what brings someone to a place of creating a piece and how much time that has taken. It, right. It's a hard thing to kind of understand the backstory. It's true. Um, and, and, uh, yes, exactly. Especially with, um, a piece like the, the Shakespeare, um, project I'm working on now, like when the brush is actually touching the paper, I could probably whittle that down to maybe 65 hours. But then, um, when I'm, when I think about the planning and the compositional planning and the research, um, that just adds on the time. And you're not just doing the birds. You are engaging in multiple different things at once. I mean, I'm just amazed by the array of projects that I've seen you work on. And you just came back from Kenya not too long ago. So how do you keep your mind kind of simultaneously on all of these various tracks and moving them all forward? I think it's the only way that I can stay focused on so many different things is by researching so many different things because it keeps it fresh. You know, there are definitely days where I'm like, I cannot look at another bird and think I don't want to paint another feather for the rest of my life. And then, um, you know, I'll spend six weeks in Kenya at an art residency, or I'll, um, I'll do a school assignment, um, you know, painting a cast sculpture or, um, you know, work in my sketchbook that's very freeing and I can do whatever I want. And then after enough time, I'm like, okay, enough of this, like, I'm ready for a feather again. So um, I think it does actually keep me very engaged to bounce around that way. Tell me about Kenya. Oh, well, so I was there for six weeks. This was an artist-in-residence program that I was accepted to back in 2019. Um, my goal has always been to do one artist-in-residence program a year um, because it's pretty economical way for artists to travel uh, long term. So I get to stay for long visits. There's great cultural immersion. You also meet other artists while you're there. So it's great networking and making friends. Um, it just really um, has everything that I want out of travel in one, you know, um, one opportunity. So yeah, the uh, Olapangi Farm is the name of the residency I was in in Kenya in Laikipia County, just at the foothills of Mount Kenya. Um, and I had to defer it for COVID twice. So um, I have been waiting to go for, you know, with, oh, excuse me, with when I was accepted and then having to defer, it was three years of waiting. And um, yeah, it was, it was funny because I had originally applied, um, I normally apply with a site-specific project. So I wanted to add a new chapter to my visual journal, my uh, visual travelogue, which is available at the gallery. Um, it was published in 20, uh, 2020, 2021, um, the Traveling Artist to Visual Journal. So originally, Kenya was going to be another chapter in that book, but because of the defers in COVID, it ended up being that the book was published before I went. <clears throat> so I ended up going to Kenya and um, kind of having this really nice opportunity to revisit this project that was kind of over. And it was really nice because I hadn't painted in my travel journal in several years and I haven't traveled and um, it was really refreshing and nice to sort of bring that project back to life and now I have it in my head to maybe do a second volume. So 
As I'm reading the work that um, Susan Cheryl Axelrod um, created in the Art Matters blog, and remembering my interview with you early on in the podcast and having uh, spent time with you over the last few years since you've worked with the art gallery, I've really been struck with how driven you are as an individual. I mean, you create goals, you set a path forward with your goals, you follow through on them, and and you also are working at the art gallery and making sure that you're making a living and... Um, I know that, uh, your husband, Joe is working on his MBA and I mean, you just have so much going on. Um, did you have a sense when you were going through your undergraduate degree that you were going to have all these various interests? Were you already that driven and did you already know what direction you wanted to go in? I think when, um, when I was an undergrad, I thought that, I was always very driven to create ambitious work and just keep creating. Um, I never put off assignments. I was usually just painting all the time. And if I was done with an assignment, I was painting again for my own pleasure. So it, I think I've always been um, sort of assisted by the fact that I'm happiest when I'm painting anyway. So, I mean, there have been times when I thought this isn't working out. Like I'm not, I'm not going to make it. And I'm never going to sell another painting and I'm ready to quit. And then I'm sort of liberated like, oh, well, I have so much free time now. All right, well, what am I going to do? I guess I'll go paint. And it's just always a thing I'm doing. So I just figure if I'm going to do it either way, I might as well continue putting my work out there. And, you know, and, and then a painting does sell eventually or I get a new opportunity and it moves me along. Um, but, yeah, it's been, uh, I think... So I think that is partially what keeps me driven is just the fact that I feel happiest and most natural when I am creating. Um, but uh, I don't, th I, I don't think I really um, anticipated how I'd have to cobble together an income from so many different sources. Um, but as soon as I started asking professional artists who are out of college, how do you do it, and how'd you get into your first gallery? they all had a very different meandering story that all, the, the one similarity is that they all had to do it you know, by, through several different sources and several different means. They either had a part-time job or they did it on the side or they you know, were teaching at the same time in illustration plus gallery sales. So I think um, you know, the more and more people I asked, I've always been very conscious of how little I know and never shy away from asking advice um, from someone more experienced than you. I mean, it's by the third person you ask that you just get the gist of like, okay, this is what it's going to take. Um, but sometimes it does kind of feel like, I don't want to say last man standing, but just continuing to stick with it. And it will eventually, it's only a matter of time. And, um, even when I was applying to my first residencies, I was rejected over and over and over again, but I just thought, you know, this is the game of numbers. And eventually, one of these is going to accept me. So I always had it in my head, like, apply to 100, and you'll get at least one. And I never had to apply to 100. I applied to about 20, and I got one. And that just kind of encouraged me, like, okay, yeah, just think of this as a game of numbers. Increase your odds by doing, you know, more, a little bit more than you think you have to, and something will come through. I mean, it really is fascinating to listen to what you've put into your career, because I think you, as an artist, you're you're putting out works that there's no guarantee they will sell. There's a there's I like doing this work. I'm going to plan to do this work. I'm going to work really hard, but I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. So you, there is an active faith involved in all of this as well. Yes, you know the but it makes it more rewarding when it's not a guarantee and it does sell. Sometimes I think of great expectations. And I'm like, how nice it would be if there's some secret admirer out there who's just buying up like every single piece I have, like in that um, book or the movie. But then um, I guess in the movie, he's an artist. And But then sometimes I think like, I mean, because at the end of that story, he's so disappointed to find out that all that time he was being propped up by a single person. I haven't read this since high school, so I should, I might be getting this totally wrong. I believe it's great expectations. Um, but yeah, I, sometimes I feel that way, like, okay. Yeah, I don't have a, a benefactor who, where it's a guarantee that it's going to sell and I'll be supported. 
but that means everyone who buys my work really has the choice not to, and they choose to acquire one. And so that must mean something to them. And that's, it makes it more special to know that they didn't have to. You know. Yeah. And that's, I think also a really great point that somebody looks at what you've created and says, yeah, I value that. And that, that's such an important feeling. And to know that that piece is going to end up back in their office or their home or wherever they end up putting it. So maybe there's also, in addition to making money off of the pieces, it's always the sense that, you know, you're, you're creating enjoyment for someone else in their life in the future. Yeah, it's pretty, um, I'm in a, a very unique role being a staff member and the uh, represented artist because I've put up a painting of my own, or um, you know, Emma showed you the selection, selection. So maybe there's a piece that's up that I love, and people walk by it; they don't notice it at all, and it's like the invisible painting. And one after another, after another, and and you start to think like, "Oh, I really thought I had something there, but I guess I didn't." And then someone will stop, and it's like they met their soulmate, and they're so wrapped up in this painting. And it's almost like what I had said about applying to something. It's a game of numbers. Um, it, same with, with viewers. Sometimes 100 people will walk by and not pay any attention, but one person, it will mean a lot to them. And it's really special and, and beautiful. I'm so happy that as a staff member, I get to see that happen. Um, yeah, because it really it makes it all worthwhile as an artist to keep creating, even if the audience as a whole um, generally is not connecting with the work when you get that when you see that one deep connection it's really um profound well missy you have inspired me um i think just to keep working hard really and to have faith i'm not a visual artist but i i think there are parallels that many of us can draw in our own lives and i think you're right i think sometimes if you're worried about external validation then it it's easy to get discouraged, but if you just keep kind of tapping back into what drives you internally, then you keep moving forward. And then maybe you do get the external validation, which is nice, but it sounds like that's not the entire thing for you. So I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. I have too, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me back. I've been speaking with artist Missy Dunaway, who you can meet if you go to the Portland Art Gallery, because not only is she a represented artist, but she also is a staff member. Um, but I certainly do encourage you to look into the work that she does. I mean, it's quite varied. You'll find birds, you'll find tapestries, you'll find other really wonderful pieces. And um, I know that we're going to see a lot of great things out of Missy Dunaway um, in the years to come. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you.